All right, so today I chose two questions. One question is a very specific question from an individual, and another question is from everybody. It's a question that we get all the time. In fact, the reason we wanted to like bring this up is actually because I've had many questions that alluded to the same thing, and then um, I've also troubleshooted this exact scenario with many people. so many people, yeah. so many clients. Um, I've helped the team troubleshoot it with their clients because this always comes up when people join the elite, this comes up. So it's something that I talk to a lot of mainly women about. Um, and I think it's something that we should address and, and really this might be the most of the podcast, but I think it's really important. So, um, I'll let you take it over from there just so we can get the questions and then we'll, we'll kind of dive into it. Yeah, for sure. All right. So, uh, the question is, it comes from anonymous cause it's so many people. <laughs> What's the difference between circuit training and straight training and why do you recommend it against circuit classes so i think we first have to define what circuit classes is um i think the most common one we see is orange theory fitness and there's <laughs> nothing against orange theory i'm not trying to like down like push put them down but we usually get that's the usually the question like how should i structure this around orange theory or like how am i supposed to do both or i just want to do orange theory uh, which first and foremost like Kudos to them. People love it. People are going, getting out there and doing something. Exactly. Yeah. So like a lot of times I'm like, well, first and foremost, where are you at? Because if you're not doing shit, I mean, we just had this conversation. Yeah. Uh, if you're not doing anything, something is better. Yeah. So if you're doing nothing right now, go do Orange Theory. If you're doing nothing right now, go do a boot camp. If you're doing nothing right now, go to the gym and do some goblet squats. Like anything you can do is better than what you're doing right now if you are not doing anything right now. So I have to preface that first. And that's why I love CrossFit too is because they got so many people lifting. A yeah. lot of people were afraid of the barbell and they got them, got them lifting. Um, so I have to put that out there. But I think that, you know, Orange Theory, Boot Camps, Soul Cycle, um, some CrossFit, some CrossFits are really, really good. Some are more circuit style or more class group style, more individual. But like this whole conversation kind of comes down to the difference between circuit training and individual design training, right? Individual strength training programs and stuff yeah. like that. And there's a bunch of different things that we can touch on with this. Um, the first one being that circuit training is mainly metabolic, um, which isn't a bad thing, but it's cardio. Yeah. So if we're just doing cardio, we're using predominantly one style of training, one energy system. We are burning calories, but we're not really focusing on movement quality, building strength, building muscle, um, improving other aspects of energy systems and hormones, things that are going to increase our likelihood to lose fat and change our body composition in the long run. I think that classes that are mainly metabolic are good at getting your heart rate up, burning calories today, short term, it's temporary. Um, and depending on the class, you're repeatedly using movements that have no ability to progressively overload. So that's the next point. It's very hard to build a foundation of strength inside of a circuit class. So if I go to an orange theory and I'm doing intervals of 30 seconds on, 60 seconds off, and I am doing the rower, I am doing bodyweight squats, I am doing burpees, I am doing TRX rows, great. I'm sweating, I'm burning calories. That is a good cardio session that you can do a couple times a week. But if you're doing that every single day, you can't add load to your rower for 30 seconds. You can't add load to your TRX. I mean, I guess you can do more reps in that 30 second period or you can add a weight vest, but there's a lot of limitation. Yeah. If you're doing a T-bar row, which is still a horizontal pull, it's still the same movement pattern, I can do eight reps of 100 pounds, then 105 pounds, then 110 pounds, and then maybe I drop the reps so I can go even heavier, or I add reps for that 100 pounds. But no matter what, there's a million ways that I can progressively overload that horizontal movement pattern. Um, and then I can just change my grip, and it's a completely new movement. Whereas a TRX row, you can only do so much with. And if you're doing it in a circuit-style class, you have short rest periods and you have limited time, limited time. And, and you really can't in a group setting like that. What can you do to progressively overload? You got a bunch of people running around like crazy rushing through the process. Um, so first and foremost, it's mainly metabolic burns, good calories, but it's basically just one energy system. It's one style of training. Point B is you can't really build strength in it because you can't progressively overload. Point C is that you're limited to the variation that the class creates. So what I mean by that is this group class is going to do this. Everybody has to do the same thing. Everybody has the same limitation. Everybody has the same equipment. Everybody has the same variation. There's no individuality in it. Whereas a strength training program, even in a group setting like the elite, where it is programmed for a group of people, it might say double kettlebell front squat, but you're in a group 
with a coach that says, if you don't have kettlebells, do this. If you don't have that, do this. If this is too heavy, do this. If you have a bum knee, do this, right? And we have all these variations. But what we are consistently promoting is a squat pattern, split squat, reverse lunge, bilateral, so goblet squat, barbell squat, landmine squat, whatever it may be. And we are enhancing or, or we're encouraging you to progressively overload that and doing it in a way that works with your biomechanics. So that's individualized. That's a program that can be built for you. Um, and I think that's very important. Inside of a class, you can't really do that. You're in a group setting. That's, it's, a, it's a class that's built for a group. And again, it's smart from a business model especially because obviously it's, they're doing really well. Yeah. Um, but B, in a large group or in a town where you want to create movement in general for obese individuals, unhealthy individuals, people who are sedentary, it's fantastic. Uh, but now we have the problem with only using one energy system. It's, it's mainly metabolic. There's no strength component. You can't progressively overload. There's no individuality with it. And then last but not least, it's not goal specific. So if you generally want to lose weight, I think that's okay. And actually, there's going to be another point I'm going to make. If you generally want to lose weight, I think it's good. But it, it is limited to a certain timeline. So if you start this class and you go 12 weeks, that's great. But at some point, you're going to plateau because of all the things I've already explained. And you have no way to progress that into new things that are going to keep enhancing your physique. So you've lost weight. Now you're like, oh, I want to build muscle. Well, this isn't a muscle building class. Or, oh, I've lost weight, but now my weight loss has plateaued. There's not enough variation to change that. Yeah. Oh, I've lost weight, but I'm not any stronger. My joints still hurt. Okay, well, there's no way to progressively overload to improve that. So all those things I talked about start carrying over into this last point of you kind of get stuck at a plateau. And then when we consider the class two, one thing I always tell people is that, so I want to backtrack just a little bit before I go into this. First and foremost, your body is an adaptation machine. I'm trying to think of a good way to articulate this. We want to adapt and we don't want to adapt. It's kind of like a double-edged sword. So if we look at strength, adaptation is good. I do 200 pounds for five reps. I adapt to that by getting stronger. That's a good thing. But if I don't change it, I'm stuck there. I adapt it and I'm stuck. In cardio, I'm doing cardio. My body adapts. It's good. I improved it in cardio. But if I don't adjust that, I will just stay there. Right? Is, it, is it accurate to say you've adapted to the adaptation? Exactly. Actually, it's very accurate. Yeah. It's kind of a tongue twister, kind yeah. of confusing, but yeah. yeah. And I think that you have to almost like stimulate the adaptation further, right? Yeah. You have to continue. It's like spectrum. You have to progress it. Um, in strength training, it's super easy. So you're doing four sets of eight at hundred pounds. Next week, you're doing four sets of seven at 110 pounds. You add weight, drop the rep. You keep doing that. Once you get to like five reps, you're doing a lot more weight. You go back to eight reps, but now you're doing 105 for eight instead of a hundred that you were doing four weeks ago. So that slow adaptation, and then you bring it back, you have these adaptation cycles. It's progressive overload. With cardio, we don't really have that. Doing 40 minutes on the Stairmaster. Burning calories, great. What's next? 45 minutes. Cool. What's next? 50 minutes. Cool. Like, But eventually, you're like, I don't have time to be sitting on a Stairmaster yeah. all day. Um, you can change the intensity of the Stairmaster. So you can change the intensity, uh, but that only goes so far, too. Yeah. Because, okay, so now <laughs> I change. 10 minutes of barely being able to exactly yeah. well in that and then okay so like i have one day of we talked about this on the last podcast i have one day of high intensity one day of moderate one day of low that's great but once your body adapts to all those you have to add duration yeah like it there always you. is going to result to you doing more of it yeah um in the gym more can be one more rep and that's a completely different movement because that's another hundred pounds that you repped, right? Because if we do reps times sets times weight, the load you're lifting, it's literally thousands of pounds you're lifting in the gym. So you add one rep to your bench press and it's a huge adaptation. Yeah. It's a huge progressive overload. That's, but that's like 10 minutes on the Stairmaster. That's a big, yeah. it's a big jump, big commitment. Um, and when we look at strength training, we don't have that. When we look at cardio, it's basically results in duration increasing. So when you go to these classes and you're doing a ton of cardio and you start to adapt, your only choice is to do more of it. It's, you can't spend every single day there because one, again, you can't adjust it for your goals. Two, you're adapting to it so it's not working as well. Um, and three, you're going to be wearing out that energy system and that's going to cause more neurological fatigue. So CNS fatigue over time, not even just CNS, but just total body fatigue in general, diet fatigue, training fatigue, muscle fatigue from the repetitive bout effect. So if you do the same thing, this is why like a lot of people in the conjugate method for powerlifting will switch their max effort lift every week. So week one, I'm doing a sumo deadlift week two, trap bar week three, rack pull week four, maybe I'm doing conventional. And then I go back to sumo after four weeks. 
because I'm changing the position of my body and it's less likely for me to hurt myself, mm -hmm. especially when you're doing heavy loads. Well, if you're doing the same thing over and over and over again, repetitive use, it's like tennis elbow. You do the same motion over and over and over again, your elbow is going to fucking hurt. Yeah. So add to this, this whole going back to the, the adaptation part of cardio, think of it like a hybrid and a gas guzzler. This is like my favorite analogy because it's so easy. When you do cardio, at first you are a gas guzzler. It, it works fucking great. And most people experience this. They go to CrossFit. They go to a class. They go to uh, do running on a treadmill, anything. Um, even in dieting, really, it works. But in general, any type of cardio modality, when you first start doing it, it works fucking great. You lose weight. You're burning calories. You feel good. You see your body changing and you're happy. But at a certain point, it stops, yeah. right? Why is that? Well, you're getting good at it. You're adapting. You're becoming a hybrid. You used to be a gas guzzler, so you were burning a lot of oil or gas, which was calories, which is stored body fat. Once you adapt to that, you become more efficient with your fuel source, yeah. which means you become a hybrid, right? Hybrids save a lot of gas, save a lot of money. It's great. Um, it's a smart vehicle. The smart thing for your body to do is to become that way and be fuel efficient. So now when I'm running 30 minutes, I burn less calories to do the activity because I got good at it, mm -hmm. right? Whereas at the beginning, I was a gas guzzler, burning a bunch of calories. So how do we avoid becoming a hybrid? Because becoming a hybrid is not what we want if we're trying to get super lean. Well, we avoid it by creating more variation, which Change. means two things. Do less cardio. So if you're going to do cardio, it's like two, maybe three times a week. And you're changing the variation like we talked about earlier. Low intensity, high intensity, moderate intensity, rower, bike, stairmaster, run, whatever it may be. Circuits. <laughs> I say circuits. When I say circuits, I mean like strongman circuits. Pull a sled, do some kettlebell swings, uh, farmer's carry, things like that. But nonetheless, you're still going in a circuit fashion. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, but... What that's going to do is create stimulate uh, variation and that adaptation process takes way longer because if I'm doing three days a week of Stairmaster, it might take me five to six weeks to adapt to that 30 minutes, right? But if I'm only doing, let's say, Stairmaster once a week, it's going to take me 15 weeks because the other two days of the week I'm doing hill sprints and then the other day I'm doing an hour-long walk with my dog. Different types of training stimulate longer adaptation phases. Um, and then we can avoid this idea of, of not being able to or, or overly adapting to the process. Because when you go in the gym, you have two choices. Change the exercise, add volume, get stronger. But there's a million variations of that. In cardio or in classes or in circuit training, you can only do so much of that. You really can't. And in a class, you have no control over it. Go longer. It. Yeah. You can go longer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do two classes in a row. And yeah. I've, <laughs> I've actually seen that. Yeah. Like people know, I've worked in boot camp settings and I've watched people go, oh, I'm going to do double class today. And part of it's like a mental grit, like good for you. Like you can keep going. The other part of me is like, you need to do something new yeah. or you need to have a smart diet approach because otherwise, well, you're just going to do double classes every day. Like that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Bring um, yeah. It, yeah, it just breaks you down. No matter what kind of training you do, if you do too much of the same thing, it will break you down and it will get monotonous. It's just boring as fuck. Um, but reeling it back so we can list this out. Like the reasons I don't suggest tons of, of classes um, is there's no individuality. It's very hard to progressively overload. You're not training st strength adaptations. You're training cardio adaptations, which is not nearly as beneficial. Um, you will plateau. And when you plateau, you basically stuck. You have no way to go anywhere. And then last but not least is this whole adaptation process. I'm talking about this gas goes versus the hybrid. You will become a hybrid at what you're doing. And that's not going to lead to long-term results. But the, the final thing I will say is two final things I will say on this topic before we go to the next question. Cause my mind, I start getting new ideas as I'm oh, talking. For sure. I want to hear it. Um, the first thing is that I have to constantly re like pull back and just say like, I'm not shitting on classes. I want people to go if that gets them moving, but I don't want them to do as much. I want to encourage people to go to the gym, to lift heavy weights, to learn how to strength train because it's going to be better for your joints. It's going to be better for your metabolism. It's going to be better for um, a better physique. I mean, if you go to the gym and you build muscle, you are going to look better when you lose weight, no matter who you are. Um, you are going to live longer. You're going to have healthier tendons. You're, you're going to be able to eat more food. You're not going to adapt as quickly. The dieting process is easier. Your mood's going to be – like there's so many positive things with strength training that – and there's not – it's not that there's not positive things about cardio because there is, but you need more strength training. And there's too many women getting sucked into this idea of like I can just go to classes all the time and I can get this body I want. And this body they're looking at is a woman who lifts heavy shit yeah. a lot. It's a 
tennis athlete. It's a CrossFit athlete. It's a pro golfer. It's somebody who is doing these activities or these sports or it's a bikini athlete on the cover of Sports Illustrated. They all strength train. Yeah. They all have trainers. They all do lift weights. They all do those kind of things. Um, even if we talk about abs, you're not going to get abs from a circuit class. You're going to get abs from doing heavy weighted sit-ups and heavy yeah. planks and farmer's carries yeah. and deadlifts and then dieting. Um, but the other piece of this too, these last two things I want to say is, is one, like I encourage people to do it. Just do less of it. And then the other thing is that if we want to build this physique we've been talking about, it requires stressing the muscular system on a, on a very, very high level. And I've seen so many women, and I see this through, there's a lot of apps out there that do like circuit style for like at home with like light dumbbells or, or bands and stuff like that. And it's great because again, it gets people moving. Then there's also classes. Um, actually, one of the classes I love more than anything is, I think it's just in Washington. It's V or V or V. Vi. Do you know what? Is it called V? Mm-hmm. We know a lot of people that go there. Yeah. They lift. They lift, yeah. And their women look good. Yeah. And they fucking lift. They're not do- – yeah. there is a circuit app, like, aspect to it yeah. because – They're doing clings. They're doing – Yeah. Like, and I yeah. think that's the thing is, like, their circuit's different instead of, like, it being, like, okay, we're doing push-ups, bodyweight lunges, burpees, and this, and you're just going in a circle for an hour. It's like, all right, we're all doing deadlifts. Yeah. Let's all deadlift together. All right, we're all doing chin-ups and push-ups. Let's all do chin-ups and push-ups together. And then they might do some like running or something at the end. And I don't know their exact programming, yeah. but I see it on social media yeah. and there's like they're popping up everywhere yeah. over here. They're crushing it. They are. Um so like I think that stuff is great, but what is the common denominator with them, with the athletes, with the crossfitters, with the women who have these bodies that other women aspire to? Lifting weights. Lifting weights. And they have muscle. Mm -hmm. And they have to build that muscle by stressing the muscular system. And what this needs is overload. And it it drives me crazy in a sense where it's like I feel you because I understand the insecurity of going to a gym and lifting because I had that. I used to – you remember Vision Quest at the Super Bowl? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I used to lift there at like 11 p.m. when I first started. Nobody was at the mall because I was like I'm not going to lift. All these motherfuckers are walking in the mall looking at me because the windows weren't blocked out. Right in the hallway. Right in the hallway. Yeah. It's the worst. So, like you're on the treadmill sweating your ass off trying to lose weight and there's just like people shopping like <laughs> looking at you. So I would go once the mall closed, which usually like 10 or later. And uh, so I get it, but it drives me crazy because I like I work with women and I'm like, hey, look, let me see your program. Um, and I'm sure there's going to be some clients of mine that listen to this and they know exactly like we've had this conversation. Um, and and it, this is this is my my way of trying to encourage you and, and push you to do this more because I know how empowering it is to lift but I'll be like, oh, can I see your program? It's like a circuit. And I'm like, how much are you lifting? It's like, oh, 15 pounds here, 20 pounds here. And I'm like, I know for a fact you can lift heavier. Yeah. I know for a fact because I know after my experience of looking at your body, I know your height, your weight, I know your structure, I know your history, I know your health. You can push yourself harder. Like I have, I have women that will post in PRs and their stuff and they're pressing 50-pound dumbbells, rowing 60-pound dumbbells, and they're not big women. They're 135 pounds and they're crushing weights. Um, shout out to Kelly. She actually, uh, I think it's in my bag. She sent me one of her shirts from their gym. I think she just messaged me. She was like, she repped 275 deadlifts and I was just like, fuck, she's 133 pounds. <laughs> oh my God. She's crushing it, yeah. but she looks lean. She's eating way more food than a lot of my clients and she has muscle. And the reason is because she's not afraid to push her body from a performance standpoint. Um, she's not, she, she lifts hard and heavy and she's not jacked. Like, and Kelly, you are jacked. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean that in a way where people, women think they're going to lift and just get like massive. Yeah. You just don't have the testosterone profile to do that. Like I've been trying for years and I'm kind of big ish, not really, but like (laughs) the point is, is if I'm trying this hard and it's a struggle, like women who have such a low testosterone profile are never going to get that from lifting. Um, but this type of lifting stresses the muscular system for adaptation that is I don't want to say super physiological, like people think like you're going to be superhuman, but to the sense that's above normal. If you do 20 pound dumbbell rows in a circuit fashion, you'll get a sweat, but studies show that sweat's not even correlated with losing fat or building muscle. It has everything to do with temperature of the room, temperature of your core and your genetics. And if you have hair, like if you have a lot of hair, you'll sweat too. But some people just don't sweat. I can work my ass off and I don't sweat because I'm just not a sweater. Some people barely do anything. They're sweating their ass off. It doesn't mean they lose more fat. It's not correlated. But with that 20-pound dumbbell, you are not stimulating the muscles to grow whatsoever. If you went from 20 to 22.2 or 22.5, sorry, to 25 to 30 to 35 to 40, and you kept progressively overloading that dumbbell row, eventually you are building strength. When you build that strength, your muscles are literally stressed to the point where they have to adapt. 
How do they adapt? They grow. Yeah. Right? So the muscle breaks down. It recovers. It adapts by getting bigger or accumulating more muscle fibers. Um, either way, you are growing the muscle, and that process is what is going to build that that look, that density, that athletic look that you want that as build. a female, yeah. that build. And more muscle means a higher metabolism. More muscle means a longer lifespan. More muscle means less osteoporosis later on in life. More muscle means less arthritis later on in life. More muscle means less disease. Muscle is in, in levels that your bone structure can support. So not when you're like Mr. Olympia juicing up, but muscle, the most muscle you can build as a natural person is going to support a longer and healthier life. And it's going to support more calories per day. So I get all these women too that are like, oh, I wish I could eat more and lose weight. Spend some time building muscle yeah. by strength training and doing something different than you're doing right now. And that's actually, and this is just turning into me like we're going off on one, but hope people don't mind that. That's another thing that drives me crazy or like I think about too is like people who are doing something and they really want to see a change. And when you're like, hey, I think you should do this. Ah, I don't want to do that. Well, what you're doing is not getting you where you want to be, right? So I think there's, I think there's also something to be said about like that scarcity of change, yeah. you know? And I think that happens in every area of your life. I mean, for me, like I can't even think about like being a father, building a team, getting this place. Um, training, I can think of a million times where I had to shift my training or do something different. It stimulated change. I was kind of nervous because it was different than what I was used to, but allowed me to improve, get better, get better results because what I was doing was not getting me to where I wanted to be. That's why I even had the thought process of doing something different yeah. or like having the conversation that led me, like the people who I have conversations with who still say no to doing more strength training and less circuit style classes. Why are we even having this conversation? Because you want change. Yeah. I have the thing that's going to give you change, but you're saying no to it because it's change and that's scary. Um, and that's kind of like, that's a huge side rant. But, but my biggest points here are like simple, like nothing against circuit classes, circuit classes, um, nothing against CrossFit, nothing against soul cycle. I encourage that stuff. I just don't encourage it to be every day of the week. Gotcha. I think that, you know, like some CrossFit classes are fine because they will implement a lot of strength work. As long as you are, physically capable from a functional standpoint, like your range of motion can support the movements that they're asking you to do. I think it's great. However, um, I think that you need changes in the type of modalities you are using. Otherwise your body will adapt too quickly. And strength training is the answer to build more muscle. It is the answer to more fat loss because long-term it leads to better fat loss and more sustainable fat loss. It is the answer to being able to eat more calories while maintaining a lower weight. Um, it is the answer to longevity. It is the answer to health. It is the answer to everything. I mean, it's the answer. It's the answer. If yeah. you're not strength training, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Um, okay, that's a little bit ridiculous. But my point being is like, um, I think that like my hopes with this this like rant of an answer to this question is that all the people who have asked it, all the clients that we work with, both myself and my team, I hope you guys hear this and you know it comes from a good place. Like I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to put down what you're doing because to me, if you enjoy that, you should do it. So for example, a, a good example of this is um, skateboarding and trail running by my house. Two things I really, really enjoy that I actually think my body would probably be better without. Um, skateboarding, I end up just super sore in my adductors and it just fucks up my workouts because I'm just not used to skateboarding. I usually bang up my shins and my ankles so I can't lift as heavy, but I have fun. Yeah. So not doing that isn't going to lead to longevity of general physical activity. Um, trail runs, I usually have a lot, like I get my shins get super sore, my calves get super sore because I can't do it very often because it's raining so much. So when I do, it, it really wears me out because I'm not a big runner. Um, and it's probably not the best on my joints. But I really enjoy being in the woods running. Yeah. Like it's just like no phone. It's just like just I just have, um, especially with the Apple Watches now, which I saw you were wearing. Um, you can store the podcasts and your music on there, so I can leave my phone at home and still listen to my shit. But since my phone's at home, I don't get notifications. Boom. It's dope. That is dope. So I went on like an hour run and I had my audio and I'm just like running with this audio book. It's perfect, dude. Uh, but. My physique would probably be better if I got really structured with cardio. I did it in safer manners, and I just stuck to specific strength training. But you got to have fun too. Yeah. So I'm not saying don't do this stuff. What I'm saying is like be open to the <coughs> fact that if you went to the gym and you lifted some heavy weights, you would like what you see better. 
it would probably give you the body that you're asking us to give you and you would be able to sustain it for much longer. So a perfect split is you're doing two days a week of these circuit classes and then three to four days a week, you're in the gym, you're lifting and you're doing a program that's individually built for you, like the programs we provide. For sure, yeah. Um, and I think that's going to be better off. It's going to be better for your joints, your metabolism, your health, your longevity, your muscle strength. You're going to have less adaptations. And I think that's the that was my biggest take home. This is the last thing I'll say and then I'll jump off my soapbox is that like the biggest take home that I want people to take away is that overdoing circuits in classes and things that are just mainly metabolic or cardio, you are doing the same repetitive energy system um, and metabolic work over and over and over again, which means you're going to plateau sooner and you're going to adapt quickly, which means that you have no room to grow unless you completely change. Yeah. So rather than putting yourself in that hole, just do a little bit of it and spend more time strength training and, and, and commit to a longer period of time. Don't yeah. worry about how much weight you'll lose in 30 days. Yeah. Think about what your body will look like in six months. Boom. That's it. And then we have one more question. So the second question is from MN Larson 15. That's, a, I believe, an Instagram name. I had a question about nutritional periodization when doing three to four weeks in a deficit and then one to two weeks in maintenance. Do you go straight to estimated maintenance or do you, do you slowly increase then spend one to two weeks there? And also, when in the three to four week deficit, do you include any refeeds in those weeks or just plow straight through? Yeah, so this is a really good question. First and foremost, I'm, we're going to link a bunch of stuff in the show notes because I have a blog on nutritional periodization. I have a video on nutritional periodization. We have two podcasts on nutritional periodization. I like periodization. And I have a couple really good Instagram posts. So we'll put all those in the show notes. I think periodization is one of the most important things that people can focus on inside their nutrition. Um, and it's usually just talked about inside their training because people usually in training – they understand that periodization is a key for strength. Um, I actually think periodization is more important in nutrition and less important in training because it can be really easy in training. For general population, I actually think it's the smartest thing to do to just periodize, periodize on a daily or a weekly basis and don't worry about monthly blocks. Um, so like in classic strength powerlifting or Olympic lifting and stuff like that, or even if you compete in anything, it's totally different, right? So I'm not talking about competitive bodybuilders, crossfitters, powerlifters, um, football, anything like that. Um, because those individuals do have to go through a accumulation phase, a realization phase, a peaking phase, um, an intensification phase, these phases that are like usually one to two months, one to two blocks where it's like just strength, just volume accumulation, mm. just intensification. Then you peak by testing and retesting maxes and then you repeat. And it's a cycle that goes over for a year, but we can plan those cycles based on when you're competing in your sport with general population. We're never competing. Yeah. So why not just stay ready yeah. all the time? Um, and the best way to do that is instead of me submitting a, a whole month on just strength or just basically gymnastic works or just aerobic capacity and like having one main focus, let's improve everything slowly. Instead of improving massively in this one month period, just one thing and then shifting to the next thing, losing some of those gains you got and then having to replenish them later on, we're going to have a day – for speed and power. We're going to have a day for strength. We're going to have a day for hypertrophy. And then we're going to have a day for aerobic capacity. And I can cycle these every week or every other week to where it's like, so we have programs that go strength day, hypertrophy day, aerobic day. And then the next week it's like strength day, uh, speed day, aerobic day. And then we have other programs that are like strength, hypertrophy, speed, aerobic, all in one week. And the w reason we're doing this is because we're slowly bringing people up on all fronts constantly because general population just wants to look good, feel good move well, right? That's the, that's really the goal. Um, when it comes to nutrition, I think that it's not as simple because are you doing weekly refeeds, bi-weekly refeeds, monthly refeeds? You're doing no refeeds. Are you doing a 12 week cut followed by a 12 week maintenance or tw I'm sorry, 12 week block followed by like a four week maintenance followed by a 12 week lean gain and then repeat. Like there's so many different ways you can go about it. And it really comes down to where are you at? What's your history? What's your goal? And what's your timeline? And if you can answer those questions, you can kind of funnel yourself into the proper thing. Now, she talked about a, uh, I think she said three to four week deficit and a one to two week yep. diet break. That sounds right. Uh, three to four week deficit, or uh, let's see here. Three to four weeks in a deficit and then one to two weeks in maintenance. So I think this is good for anybody who's doing long-term weight loss. It, it's hard to like suggest that for a 12 week timeline because you do that three cycles, you're already over 12 weeks, right? Yeah. So 
for most people doing like 16 plus weeks. Or if you don't have a necessary timeline, you're like, hey, this is this might take me 12 weeks. It might take me 24 weeks. I don't care. Like yeah. I'm just going to go until I get to my goal. For those individuals, I think this is a great strategy because three to four weeks gives you enough time to actually lose weight. Um, I've recommended 5-2 in the past where it's like five days on a deficit, two weeks at maintenance. And that works well, but you have to be in a big deficit on those five days. Um, and you have to have a really responsive body because five days isn't that long in a deficit. And for somebody to lose significant weight in five days, it's tough. So for some people whose body is just like, basically perfect for dieting. Like you give them anything that's going to work. Like they're very responsive. It's great. But for a lot of people, they have an adaptive body to where it's like five days isn't long enough because your body adapts so quick or your body's stubborn and it takes 10 days to see any loss. So I've had people that I'll do 10 days in a deficit, two days refeeding. So it's the same five, two approach, but 10, two. Yeah. Um, so with a three to four week diet, I actually, this is honestly probably one of my favorite styles. Cause I think it's just in my experience, what has worked best. And it gives you a full one to two full weeks of, of maintenance at diet break. And that's really enough time to not only restore metabolic processes and adaptation and refuel uh, the psychology of dieting, diet fatigue, and just training and uh, replenish muscle glycogen, but it's also enough to reverse the adaptation, which a two-day diet break will basically push the pause button on your diet fatigue and your, your metabolic adaptation, but a full week plus will actually start to reverse those processes and move you towards health instead of just slowing down the negative effects, um, which is why I like this. But in like to simplify the answer, three to four weeks should be aggressive, no refeeding. If you're refeeding, what's the point of doing the diet break, right? You're kind of, you're taking yourself out of the diet during the diet before the diet break comes. So spend three to four weeks. And this is what it takes somebody that's committed to the process because you have to have three to four, four full weeks dieting in a deficit. Sure. And then you have to have one to two full weeks at maintenance. And you wouldn't reverse in that process because again, if we look at what a reverse diet does, a slow reverse Yes, it eases the blow of higher calories, but it also delays the amount of time that you're out of a deficit. So it's basically dragging the deficit time longer. Mm -hmm. So if I spend three weeks in a deficit and then I spend one week reversing, during that reverse diet, yes, I'm eating more calories, but technically I'm still in a deficit because I'm not at my maintenance yet. I'm reversing towards that maintenance. So it takes me a week to get there. Then I spend a week at maintenance and now it's really a four to five week deficit with a one week diet break. Versus a three to two. Because you're working your way up. Exactly. Okay. So what I would recommend people to do is three to four weeks of dieting and then immediately jump up to maintenance right away. It's like literally today I'm in a deficit, tomorrow maintenance. There's mm -hmm. no delay. It's just right to it. Um, will you gain weight? Yes. But if you jump to maintenance, you are not going to gain fat. The reason you're not because you're at maintenance. Think about it. If you're at maintenance, you can't gain weight. You need to be in a surplus to gain weight. So... If you bring your calories to maintenance right away, you will gain weight purely just muscle glycogen and food volume. So if we look at like, okay, so you're dieting on 150 carbs, and then you bring them up to 250 for your diet break. 100 extra carbs is going to be 300 to 400 extra grams of water stored in your body. Not a bad thing, but your muscles are going to be full. It's going to weigh down the scale. Add to that, 100 extra grams of carbs is, I mean, what's that? Two cups of, two full cups of white rice and like two cups of broccoli. It's a lot of food. Yeah. It's just sitting in your stomach. So now you got to think too, like just that amount of food plus all the water it pulls in. Plus usually when you add more food, you add more salt because we salt food, add condiments, stuff like that. So if there's more food to add salt on too, there's going to be more salt. Okay. Um, so now we have extra water, extra food, extra carbs, extra salt, all those things weigh down the scale. It's not fat. It's just, it's just water weight. So you take the diet break, you gain two pounds of water weight three days into the deficit that you're in again, you lose that water weight and now you're back to losing. So it's like diet three pounds off, diet break a pound back up, lose that pound in three days of the deficit. And then you have another week and a half to lose another couple of pounds um, or two and a half weeks if you're doing a three, three week deficit. Um, so three to four weeks, pretty aggressive, no refeeds, one to two weeks, full diet break, no transition, no reverse diet, just straight to the point, get right into the deficit. Um, avoid delaying that process because you want to get up there as soon as possible. Um, and taking a slow progressive approach to the reverse diet is only designed for people who are completely done with a diet and they have a long timeline to get out of it. And even then you should take an aggressive enough approach to where you're bumping your calories up to a point where you're like, I think I might be at maintenance, but I might have room to grow. Um, I'm a much bigger fan of aggressive reverse diets just from a health standpoint at this point, in my career, just from how many reverse diets we've done. Um, and we just see that they work a little bit better. Um, I think I answered that question. Yeah, 
Absolutely. So every, every uh, aspect of it. So three to four weeks, full deficit, be aggressive, no refeeds. One to two weeks, go straight into the maintenance uh, level calories, stay there. Um, if you lose weight, this is another good tip. If you lose weight during the diet break, I would consider increasing the carbs or the calories of that diet break. Yeah. Because typically that means that you weren't at true maintenance or you're really stressed the fuck out. <laughs> so that sometimes is a sign that like, if you, if you like, so for example, this is, this sounds like completely doesn't even make sense, but it happens three to four weeks in a deficit. Don't lose any weight. One to two week diet break, lose two pounds. Doesn't make any sense. But my guess is that you're stressed out. You start dieting. That puts more stress on your body. Cortisol goes up. Water retention goes up. Your body's fighting the adaptations you're trying to create. And it's just a, like you're just a slow grind of nothing. Mm-hmm. And then when you re- refeed with the diet break, you give yourself more carbs. Insulin goes up. Cortisol goes down. Stress is relieved. You train harder, burn more calories. You eat more, burn That's more right. calories. You move more, burn more calories. You start losing weight. Go back in the deficit. Your body's stressed out again. Yeah. So with those individuals, I do one of two things more frequent diet breaks or just completely take them out of the diet um, and just reverse diet them. The problem with just taking them out completely is that if you go straight to maintenance calories all the time, after a week or two, they stop losing weight and they won't because now they're at maintenance. So sometimes it is good to still like go back into the deficit, but maybe you're doing a week maintenance, week deficit, week maintenance, week deficit, instead of waiting so long to get into that diet break. For sure. Is there any way to relate um, those the first question circuit training classes with nutritional periodization? Yeah, actually, I, I think that there's a few things that we can consider here. I think it it kind of depends on what they do mm-hmm. with the circuit training, like the advice I gave on that. Yeah. Because I see a lot of people, and this is actually another benefit of why you should do more strength training. I see a lot of people who buy into what I'm telling them with the strength training and they'll get out of the circuit training, not maybe not completely, but do more of it. So maybe they're doing five days a week of Orange Theory Fitness, but then I come on board and now they're doing two days of Orange Theory Fitness and three days of strength training. During that period, I give them more diet breaks or I just bump their calories up in general. So the nutritional periodization side of that is like you can actually linearly increase calories as you introduce strength training at higher volumes because you're stressing the body at a greater degree and you're using more muscles um, at a greater capacity than they're used to, which requires more fuel to replenish, which means more calories. On those strength training days. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, And I mean – Sometimes I will do just the strength training days, but sometimes I'll just across the board raise them because they're still recovering the next day. Even yeah. though they go to Orange Theory, they're recovering from the strength training, right? Yeah. Um, just like if you do a hard Orange Theory or a hard class in general, you're still recovering the next day. Um, so now we can increase your calories or we go from doing a three-week deficit, one-week diet break to like a two-week deficit, two-week diet break because we introduce so much strength training that you need more diet breaks because your body's under more stress. Um, but, you, but this is the cool thing. Same weight loss last longer, eat more calories in the process, and you have more muscle at the end. Uh So combining the two, it's like if you do the strength training, you can utilize more of the nutritional periodization tools to your advantage by increasing more calories. 